Hello, ladies and gentlemen. We are Adventuresome Reviews. The audacious, the not terribly bright people who have decided to investigate the world of indie books. It's, I am a genius. He is my sidekick. I'll be a sidekick all you want. You're like a kick in the side. Today, we are reviewing March of Magnus by Robert J. Power. Oh, hey, you actually remembered I'm, it. Like I said, I'm a genius. Which is the sequel to a book we quite enjoyed, which goes by the title of Spark City. I imagine it has a series name as well. Yeah, something to do with, oh, it might even be just be the Spark City cycle. Yeah, there you go. That's imaginative. Yes. The, the, book two has a much more fantastic name, if I do say so. Yes. Book one had me rearing to go for book two. I was really excited because book one, as a recap, did a really great job of hyping up Magnus. And so I was really excited to see what Magnus could do. Yes. So I was a little disappointed when the book featured very little of Magnus actually marching and fighting and... I suppose. Generally. <laughs> that being said, this is a sequel, so I'm not entirely sure. I'm hoping, I should say, all of you people n either read or watched the first review. Regardless, we may be splitting this into a spoiler and non-spoiler section, but you will never know until we do it because we are mysterious and we like to be swanky. If nothing else, I think we, should, we have free reign to spoil both. Book one for once. I disagree egregiously, which makes no sense, but we'll pretend it does. Yes, you have your right to disagree. It's a very dumb right. Vehemently. 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 Verminiously. Verdantly. I vehemently. Vehicularly. <laughs> Abhor your pronunciations of all those words. Anyway, unto the March of Madness. The point that he completely ignored and just blindly agreed with, and it is still a point that I was mildly disappointed with with the book. I did want to see more of the campaign elements or more of a campaign aspect. And when instead, what we got was more political. Isn't even the right word. Because one of my greatest issues with the book was that it felt fat and bloated with a lot of stuff. Like, both on, like, the prose level, but on the book as a whole. It felt like a lot of making time and filler actions. It didn't... That did not strike me. Mostly because I... Like, on the minutia, maybe, but... On the macro, all the scenes had a place for... Had a place... And they were either building toward future narratives or narratives that are going to come into play in book two. You had a lot of side, you had a lot of side arcs and side plot lines, which may lead to the bloat because in book one, the book one was entirely focused on Arrow and I even Leah. Know, Leah, right? It was a intensely character focused on their budding relationship and how they survived numerous travails and got eaten by wolves at some point. And I think that's kind of where the bloke came in because the book, book two was much the same. Hyper character focused. Which is always great and lovely. Yes, but it had a variety. It had three or four character f pairs it was trying to focus on. And two of those pairs weren't that different. Like the, the, the book initiated. To some extent, uh, the book, both books have fo focused primarily on the romantic entanglements of first Arrow and Leah, and then two new couples that are ushered into the fore in the March of Magnus. All the relationships feel very similar. They start out extremely antagonistic, and mostly it progress towards more romantic they don't, like the various people don't have don't the romance 
the romances feel very similar, but they don't necessarily all start in the same location. Like, uh, one of the romances dealt in here is a former couple that, or not a former couple, but a couple that started out all green and rosy, but has since along come across choppy waters. Whereas Arrow and Leah, they started out choppy. Yeah. But however, you still once again deal with um, all the art. The tra travails that affect each relationship are very similar, despite the starting locations being vastly dis dissimilar. Yeah. And so, but continuing with that, it is such a character-focused book that the plot line gets pushed to the back. The plot line feels more and more, not feels per se, but it's so often just the stage for the character motivations. And so it is, you're constantly experiencing scenes and looking at the, the underlying plot from the sideline. For instance, there's the whole South, Southern, South, I think it's Southern. It's weird because they come from the frigid, but it's South. Yeah. You have their invasion. They feature barely at all in the book. But they're a constant threat. And then there's a underplot line well, of... They're not even a constant threat. They're just the looming threat of the story. It's the general um, end goal of defeating these Southerners is the end goal of the story. Yeah, and so part of the focus of this book is of preparing for that invasion. But the preparing for that invasion happens almost all off-screen. It is completely sidelined. The entire plot of the book is sidelined by the character narratives. And that, I think, is probably where most of the bloat, or the feeling of bloat comes from. Yeah. It's it, unbalanced is probably a better way. book one, it was easier to have an intensely character-focused um, narrative because, one, there you just had one set, one set of... Uh, one couple. And so you could really were, invest and explore right, and it. And they were going somewhere. Every chapter was them uh, striving to meet this destination they had in mind. And they were, they it, they encountered various difficulties and you were slowly introduced into the general plot line of the Southern Invasion. In book two, you don't have that, me you can't, you suffer from that meandering pace because the plot is suddenly a lot more prominent in the character's mind. And and what? it's completely divorced from the character narratives. The plot and the character narratives have almost zero connection. And it kind of feels like the book just forgets about it. The characters talk about the Southern uh, invasion a great deal, but the sort of the invasion itself may has a place in three chapters ish and only one really where it's actually actively in the story doing th something which and that happens at the way end of a fairly and this is large a big book. book right all that said we really did like the book still i have hoarded with the thousand suns and cherry blossoms and roses He's lying i, I saw am. him setting up black um pentagrams and worshiping and trying to set it up as a new religion i was very spooked one night i woke up it would have found worked. wax on my face as he was sharpening a knife i practically moved out of the house at that point it would have worked but i used the wrong the wrong wax i needed babylonian all i had was sumerian it's a good thing i <laughs> bought up all that years ago no the pe stars are using them to teleport uh I'm not entirely sure we should pull those references. Part of the fun of references is to try, shoot into the dark to see if anybody catches it, and the other 50% is if you actually got it right. You, you okay, you kind of only got it right, because the, the that particular wax was not mentioned in any great, or the point of origin for that wax, I should say. Regardless. Uh, so. Something you did like. Okay, so something I did like is tying back to the something I something I just now realized, and it has to deal with the three primary relationships. There's actually four because you have Magnus and his wife, which I really liked. I, you, well, I want to get we'll, we'll get we'll get, that's actually a discussion worth having with various minutia. Uh, for now, I'm, I want to discuss with the three main characters, which is um, you have recur, uh, returning heroes from the first book. 
Arrow and Leah, who are at, who have r absolutely fantastic in this book. A really healthy relationship, finally. Um, I'll be at one still with Thorns, but Thorns, they're just help me. Relationship. Uh, then you have two more, right? You have Emir and Roja, and then you have, um, would it be Roja or Roja? I, I, I pronounce it one way or the other. It flip false for me. And then, what was the second two? I don't remember their names. It's right. been months. All right, My so brain has the lifeline of a gold. Something I just realized is the women in these relationships are all identical. Pretty much the spitting images of each other. And the only differences in the relationships come as a result of the men. So you have Amir, and I really enjoyed Amir because he is a tortured, um, drunkard, self-loathing, but at the same time, um, an exceptionally skilled healer who is bound and determined to cure all the all the world's ills. He cannot stand suffering, and he basically is tending to an entire. So actually, several villages worth of, in fact, uh, refugees. It, refugees, pretty much free of charge. And he is working himself to the bone while being this um, incredibly alcoholic and self loathing. And this great deal of the story is about him scratching and crawling to some degree of comfort with himself. Failing repeatedly, and just this constant seesaw of him slowly becoming healthy. And yeah. the story is not even done yet. That is how slow and tumultuous his um, narrative is. And he is paired with Roja, who is the exact, like I said, is the exact same as every other female in the book. Exact same is a little bit different. They all share archetypes. They're all highly competent, extremely proud, and extremely... Um, I, I don't know if there's a specific word there probably is, but they have to maintain the imagery of their perfection. They are... All, and it's not just, um, it's, it's not a, I, I am perfect, so I must maintain the perfection. It is, they feel the onus to maintain the They have a of, standard to maintain. And it is crippling to them, but they all share it. And so all those three competence, and you might seem like competence and pride would be good character traits to have. And they are to some extent, but they are extreme. Like competence is rarely bad, but their pride is extremed. And, and it, it, what, in tied with their need to be perfect and for to be respected and um, to some extent worshipped, but that's too much, it often results in an almost toxic mix. Right. And that's part, kind of the point of their society of the female yeah, alkalines. So on one hand, it works really well because you have this up. Uh, their bloodlines are called the alphas. They're the best of the best. And... The book does an exceptionally good job of building this alpha culture, right? Yes. And but, and as you see, it's it lends to some very tox toxic and unpleasant character traits that are intentional, right? They are not accidents of the, that make that's making the story bad. They're actively intentional import affecting the story, and the alpha culture is bled into the books throughout the book, throughout entirely, and you have lower lines, which is this lower bloodlines. and So the alpha culture is really, really well handled. Part of the reason I, I feel all the women are near identical is that a lot of the problems in the relationship stem from the men and their various um, difficulties, and the women all have the exact same reaction. Their pride makes them unforgiving, sharp-tongued when they really shouldn't be. It's the same story again and again. So the men go make a slight mistake or speak a little wrong, not intending any evil. 
And the, all the women will blow up over this. They'll blow up. It's once again a little extreme, but really not too much so. And so the men constantly generate these new problems, which is interesting. Because obviously Amir is incredibly self-toxic, and Arrow was um, like a little just inexperienced and very self-contained. And so these generated different scenarios that the women all responded to had the sim same reactions to. Yeah, and... Well... But also a certain level of... No, never mind. Just because the women have their own storylines. Yeah. Roja is supposed to be... Is the next one in charge for... Spark City, she's heir elect, and that, and she, and the book employs that storyline, and builds into it. But Amir, who is her romance counterpart, no, because he even he doesn't affect the storyline so much, but he butts heads with her a lot, with that in the viewpoint. And Leah Amir and Roja, their relationship was absolutely fantastic throughout. Yeah, and so it's, I guess it's just saying that. Even though the women respond the same way, it's not that they don't have their own storylines. It's just they all have the exact same oh, faults. That is the problem. And so the same faults lend toward a lot of the similar repeated um, scenes, even yeah. though the scenes themselves are different in some fairly major ways. Yeah. And like each relationship in and of itself is significant. Very well handled. The problem is that there's three of them happening all at the same time and dealing with very similar faults on the on the hands of the women. Yeah. And the men have their own but faults Also, too. just there being three of them means that you have less time to hyper-focus on the progression of any one. Like the same way, to making it unable to focus on the progression of any one in the way that Arrow and Leah's relationship was really well paced and had its mix of ups and downs throughout the first book. And in this, Amir and Roja in the book two was the one that was really well handled. Yeah. Now, just to clarify, the women are not, are not the slow, sole problem child in the relationships. Both, already, both parties help and abet the great travails that happen. Yeah. Repeat, the woman that Magnus and his wife was Elaine, I believe. No. Eli? Elise? Elise sounds like it. We may be wrong, so don't go. We'll just it. call her the wife. Yeah, because that's gonna go over well. <laughs> I Magnus and Elise I really liked. Magnus more or less lives up to your expectations. Yes. And he just had a re again, like Leo and Arrow, Leah and Arrow had a really enjoyable relationship with his wife and absolutely adores her. <laughs> Pretty much worships the ground she walks on in a very non toxic way. Because they butt heads and they argue, but at the same time, it's like the love and adoration there is so unquestioning. It's just. And not it feels authentic, in part because. Both of them feel like they deserve it. Like, both of them, without, quote-unquote, doing a huge amount physically in the book, the legend, their legend was built up so effectively in book one that you don't really need to see it proved. You just, you're just sad you don't get to see it <laughs> actively in the works. But still, it's both of them feel well-deserving of their laurels, and so it makes their relationship really enjoyable. But also just, I really enjoyed them as characters. Yeah, and... To some extent, uh, they they earn their laurels, and then you also see their you see scenes where over where they earn it again, and they do impressive things. Yeah. Cause, so okay, um, the Primarch of Spark City, who is the current ruling queen of the this little nation here, gets wind that. The Southerners are marching to war, so she basically says, uh, Magnus, get your ass over here. We need you to fight this war for us, because he's this ancient general who whooped up all four nations in his old, in, in you know, the past wars, right? So he saddles up with 
is three, four hundred troops, and Elise decides to go with him because she says, just try to leave me behind, and they go on this journey of miles, and basically she has tubercul she has late stage tuberculosis, and she's just like flipping the birds to the disease. It's that kind of thing. Yeah. I, th I think we uh, let's delve into the actual plot line of a little bit. So, book one ended with Errol getting tossed off a cliff after fighting the evil demigod. Ah! Book two starts out with Leah, who snuck after him, because he... This is complicated. Errol was captured, and he was thrust into a duel with the evil demigod king, right? Then, at the climax of which, he was tossed off a mountain. Miles through um, frozen air into a freezing ri river, half dead from starvation and exhausted and whoop and horribly battle battle scarred. Right, that guy is like dead. He's just he should be dead. And it was like literally a mile drop. Leah, who followed him, who's been following it in the um, wings for a little while, dove into the river and dragged him out <laughs> in the middle of winter. In the deep, deep, in the middle frozen of the night, south, right? And so that is the starting location for that is the starting scene for the book, which is absolutely fantastic because she then has to drag this basic dead man through snow and dark and forest while they're being hunted by an entire army who is literally sniffing at their heels. I forget exactly how they escape but I think they dig a pit in the snow and cover themselves with it. As a start to this book, that is just absolutely great. The very next absolutely great thing is happens two chapters later as Errol then starts dealing with the psychological trauma of this all and he's just like, I don't want to fight anymore. And that in itself is another great storyline. And those that's just like the first, you know, I enjoyed that storyline up until it threw their relationship into question. This isn't that spoiler issue because all in the first couple of chapters, but it's like, eh. it, like they had all their relationship troubles in the first book. So to start the second book off with more, that felt a little repetitive, and it, that also builds into the relationship troubles in that as we progress to the major romances for the book. But still, the book manages to move um like when the book is not dealing the solely with the relationships between the various characters it's it has a masterful ability to move from impactful scene to impactful scene and narrative right it's not one it is one large overarching narrative but the steps are each individually incredibly engaging with new difficulties and um complications yeah for instance, um, after the faction wars that um, Magnus won, he ceded power to the current Primarch and agreed to limit his military forces, among other reasons. Right, because he stuff. simply didn't want to be king. So he now has to march to uh, the current Primarch and say, give me your army so that I can fight this battle. And she's like, no, I don't want to give you my armies. You are too dangerous. You must bow down and swear your loyalty to me, loyalty to me first. And this is an understanding because Magnus, is, this is an understandable qualm on her part because Magnus is practically the boogeyman. Yeah. Because I mean, he didn't just, he won a war on three fronts last time. She does not want to give him an army without his loyalty. Yeah. I've been talking a lot. You come up with something. I don't know if there's anything more I really have to say for it. But there's lots of stuff to talk about the book and applaud and gush and. I'm not so sure that there is. There's like the entire Siggy arc. Yeah, fine. If you don't want to discuss anything more, we don't have to. Well, because the Siggy arc didn't wasn't really a story. That was that's another instance of I did not like the ending for the book, and that the Siggy arc was part of that. Okay. 
So there's a pretty big spoiler with the ending of the book that I don't want to get into, but they have they already have a pretty significant threat to deal with with the Southerners. Yeah. And so a lot of this book felt like manufactured conflict. And okay. it ended with they already and it ended by worsening an already dire situation. I so do you dislike the ending or do you dislike the um spoiler per se the spoiler event i actually like that okay so not without getting into its details the spoiler event happened and i was like oh you bastards which is a mark of a well done scene and narrative moment agreed and so it did not strike me as too much i was just it did not strike me as too much, heaping too much um, onto the, our protagonists or an, an impossible situation or anything like that. I was deeply infuriated, not at the author, but at the characters who did the uh, this mysterious act of spoiling. Yeah, and it just... I didn't like it. Like, everything you said is correct, I just... So much of the book felt like filler conflict. You spend so much time getting Magnus and the Patriarch, or the Matriarch, whatever it is, whatever her name is, to reconcile and get everything lined up. You spend so much time working on that, and then you have random events that throw that into danger, and additional conflicts added, and... Everything in the city is in ruins, practically. And then you end that, and you throw that final blip in, that final spoiler in, and it's just... The book didn't need more conflict, more narrative. I guess, but... I don't actually know how I would have wanted it to go any other way. It's just... They have such a monumental task to overcome as is because the southern army is huge. Yeah, but Magnus is um, such a powerhouse and you have such faith in his character that if everything had gone swimmingly for the main protagonist, it may have sapped some of the danger and questions. Uh, agreed, and part of it is I would have liked the southerners to actually be dangerous. Okay, yes. The southerners are basically an untrained army who, ran, who fled... It's because the Southerners, they couldn't win the fight on their own. They couldn't, they're not, all the, both books are about defeating the Southerners. You couldn't, the Southerners can't even be made their own threat. There had to be spoiler so they could be actually threatening. And it's just, I, I, I didn't like that. I wanted Magnus to fight the Southerners. And part of it is the whole of the March of Magnus. I wanted to see him actually march and fight. Yeah. But part of it is also just the story is about fighting the Southerners, not about all the shenanigans that go on in the city, per se. But and yeah. that's not even exactly right. It's just there comes a point where you... And you can keep throwing curveballs at the story, and eventually you're just tired of, okay, I'm tired of another random conflict cropping up or another random issue. And some of it is that you had the previous significant change to the dynamic that threw everything into chaos, and so to have something else. We cut, This is a place where my brother and I disagree a little. A little? I probably agree with him that there may be a few too many curveballs, but at the same time, I really enjoyed how the book kept changing the, um, it kept adding, changing the rules, adding new dynamics, and changing the state of affairs in the story. You had these various major events happen that had this very distinctive shift and change on where people stood on sides and the goals that need to be accomplished. Yeah, but it... Very few goals actually were. You never achieved a goal that... 
that where you never reached a goal and something happened that changed what needed what you needed to do next. It was you're working towards a goal, something happens, you have to turn at a wrangle, keep going, something else happens, you turn, something third happens, you have to go backwards. It you ne the book never allowed you to reach any kind of ending or success. It was just a constant stream of never reaching the destination. Okay, that yeah, that I can see. I still like how the book changed. The Agreed, dynamics. I like how the book changed and the dynamics. But I would have liked there to be some closure to some of the stuff that happened. But that's suppose. actually a thing. You read 700, almost 800 pages of book. Nothing closed. Nothing ended. Nothing was resolved. Nothing. Yet nothing, absolutely nothing. Anything, the only things that were resolved were Arrow's um, post-traumatic stress. And that was resolved in the first um, five chapters or so, what have you. Not quite that badly, but. And... <laughs> Yeah, nothing was really resolved. It's like you they were starting to get resolved, but then you would get a curveball and you would have to go off and do something else completely. Because even the third relationship, which we haven't talked about at all, isn't resolved yet. Yeah, and... Yeah, so it's just... It was almost like the characters were never allowed to actually do something. Oh, no, they were allowed to do anything. They were just never allowed to actively achieve something. Or, or allowed to finish it. Even on the cusp of finishing something. Like, Victory... Um, Arrow has just about achieved something. He's won a duel, right? He has clearly won the duel. Uh, the leader at... Uh, the queen says... You have won the duel, right? It, but, it was, but because it was a duel that was supposed to end in death, his opponents decide to say, we're not dead yet, we're going to whoop up on him and just cheat our way through this. After Errol turned away, she just sort of says, fine, this duel is done. I was declared the victory. He won the duel, and the book said, not, nah, not really. Yeah, and it, <laughs> so... Which... It does have its benefits because it's like it's a constant kick in the teeth to the um, main characters where they just can't get a win. Yeah, but every now and then I like a win. Yeah. Like, that's there's nothing wrong with letting your characters actually succeed occasionally. To some extent, I have less trouble with this because Arrow and Leah's relationship, being at, at the healthy stage it is, is just like a constant win throughout the book. It's they've, And the same to, goes to so... And the same is with Magnus and his wife. It's a constant win, yes. Whenever those two are on the screen together, or sorry, not whenever either of those couples on the screen together, it's like, this is such a healthy relationship. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's really getting to the point with both couples having just a really nice relationship. Yeah, and a uh, thing that can't go, that is worth mentioning is that the book does have good action scenes. It has several sprinkled throughout, and they are good, both on the a single person dual level and the the book has a really good job of not being hyper specific mm -hmm. like he swung high and then left and then it's down. not a bullet point um but it of still comments. gives you a close enough view of what's happening so you can feel your way around and get the feel of a, from the perspective of a single person but also it does a pretty good job of doing it from like the grand battle side and it does handle these well yeah you had a battle at the, near the climax because, of course, you did. It's Magnus versus the Southerns, Southerners, and Spoilers. actual tactics were used. It was like, oh my god, this is so awesome! Like, actual tactics I understand from my very extended history, not really, of playing war games. Yeah, it's just... It, the conflict of the book is really well handled. Uh, do you have anything else you wanted to say? No, except that this may have dragged on a little bit longer because... My throat is killing me. Weakly. Quite. So, I think we'll just, we'll kill this loping conversation and say... With a review. Oh, so. yes. Four stars. I would have given it 3.5. I know, and you are a stingy worrywart. <laughs> I have nothing but sustain for you and your ilk. I'll diss you next time. You can try. Goodbye. Au revoir. Das Vidanya. We uh, depart.
fairly well, our future friends.